Thank you, Brother Merton Graves, for the theme song. Thanks to God again. Uh, we welcome everyone back inside for our last lecture of day four in the face-to-face -face morning session. Of course, after lunch, we have a lecture and then our group book study. Day four of camp, after this four days left, time flies. But we thank God for all that he has been teaching us. Thank God for his mercy. Today, uh, I'm continuing with the wrath of God, part four. And if you've been following, just before I pray and begin, you will be able to answer a few questions. Whenever God gives a people up to their choice, which choice is against his will, that is, that is the Pauline definition of wrath. True or false? True. However, however small the departure is in our eyes when God gives them. We'll prove it today. And when God exercises wrath with mercy, he can give a people up to their wrong choice and still work with them in that wrong choice to seek to bring them back to his right way. So wrath with mercy. Partial wrath can be without mercy. Partial wrath can be with mercy. Only one person has suffered full wrath without mercy. That's the Son of God as our substitute and surety for us. What love. Thank the Lord. He endured the full separation from his Father and the agony we can never comprehend. The details of that we will study throughout eternity. And the more we study it, the more we will love God and understand that he's the God of love and freedom. And that since sin says I don't want you, God has to give it up because he cannot break his law of love and freedom. So we will pray and begin. I want you to follow carefully. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day four of Camp 2022 and the messages thus far given. As we come to the last lecture before lunch and then look forward to the afternoon session, we ask you to continue to bless, edify, and above all, bring us to that intimate relationship with you in Jesus Christ that Relying only on what he has done for us and surrendering all, we will make his victory our own for sanctification, victory over sin, and perfection of character and ripening for the harvest. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Okay, so follow me carefully. Things that we know already, God is love. Where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. We will prove these things again from the Bible, but we should know them. God gives freedom of choice to all, and he respects that freedom, listen carefully, and cannot violate it. This is a thing that generally in Christendom people don't understand. People ask, why didn't God stop that airplane from crashing? And ask all of those questions because they do not understand the issues involved in the great controversy and what is meant by a God of love and freedom or what we have chosen. I remember one day I got into my car. It was on empty, and it had been on empty for a while. There's a difference between faith and presumption. And I still proceeded to take a chance to try to go up to Christchurch, saying that I would reach a gas station before I reached Silver Sands. The car stopped. 
You know, when I was a boy, my mother had a term called fully de fif. You know all time Bajan terms? Car stop, and I called my mechanic. My mechanic said, Dr. Duggan, you might have gone to university to study medicine. And I respect that. But the car want gas. A man seeing me stall got out and said, Doc, let me have a push out to the road to push it one side. We went down to the gas station, had to buy a can and gas, put it in. The car started. Now, if I had sat down that car praying to God, God would say the same thing my mother, my mother would call me, fully the fifth. As Brother Saul just said, you have to prepare before the event. If you know the car empty fully the fifth, why are you driving to Christ Church? I said, well, well, well. Lessons in every detail of life. Okay? Sowing and weeping cause and effect. Now, God didn't cause me to stop. And telling me that God is in control, so I, I can be push off the word is not helping me. I should have put in gas. What human power can do, divine power is not called to do. Small little lessons. I said, well, well, well. So I, I had to call myself what my mother called me, fully the fifth. That might be fully the sixth by that time. But thank God for his mercy. The law of love is the law of freedom. There can be no freedom without love and no love without freedom. Both love and freedom are transcripts of God's character. Having got these points, let's go to the scriptures. 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God is in him. Praise the Lord. Now the Lord is that spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. God is love. God is the God of liberty. And Revelation 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life. How? Freely. Freedom of choice. Freedom of love. God hates a forced worship. That is why when Babylon forces people into whatever kind of worship they want, even if it were the right kind of worship, they're wrong. God hates the forced worship. So remember these three passages before we go any further as we lay a foundation. Okay. So God's agape love does not, in fact, cannot hurt anyone. It is separation from God's love and righteousness that produces hurt. Listen to Paul, Romans 13, 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You can't want it clearer than that. God's love is the expression of his law, which is the expression of his nature and character. God doesn't have one law for him and another law for creatures like dictators on the earth and some people in Adventism. Believe that. As a matter of fact, that is one of Satan's lies. So for God to demonstrate that, he sent his son here as a human being where you have laws like obeying your parents and so on. And Jesus as a child perfectly obeyed his parents showing that whatever the circumstance, whatever the law, God obeys his laws because God's law is an expression of his character. Okay? Just as how Satan tells lies naturally, God does right naturally. His law is his nature. Not an arbitrary set of do's and don'ts. It, his law is a transcript of his character. Look at Proverbs 12, 28. In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. So if in the way of righteousness there is life, 
and in the way of righteousness there is no death. And God is righteous in all his ways. Tell me how you are going to get death in God or from God. Just tell me. Proverbs 8, 35, 36, the Son of God speaking. For whoso findeth me, findeth life. Praise the Lord. And shall obtain favor of Jehovah. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Again, you can't want it any clearer than this. And we're, we're doing all these from the Bible and Bible alone. On Sabbath, we'll bring this spread of prophecy comments on the same area. Proverbs 8, 35, 36. Whoso findeth me, findeth life. Remember what we just said there? Let's go back to it. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And Jesus says, whosoever come, he will in no wise cast out. So watch now what he says in Proverbs. Whoso findeth me, and we find him by heeding the invitation to come. Now, some people will know the invitation, have heard the invitation, refuse to come, and then blame others for their not coming. And when they get to the judgment seat, they'll be like the man who went in without over the garment. He had a lot of talk at the door. But when the king came in, how came us in thou hither without a wedding garment? The Bible says he was speechless. Okay, whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Clear as daylight. So God's agape love does not, in fact, cannot employ tactics of fear or a compulsive force. Because in the great controversy, God cannot force himself where he's not wanted. As a matter of fact, he holds on as long as possible. When it approaches the point where to hold on any further, he would be breaking his own law of freedom of choice. You heard that? <laughs> it's a serious matter, you know. Look at the Bible, 1 John 4, 16 to 19. And we have known, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. Praise the Lord. We have known and believed the love that God has to us. I usually say the Holy Spirit has a timetable for every individual. Every individual has choice. You ask a lot of people who are skylarking with God, you know that God loves you? Yes, 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 but when are you ready? Okay. Keep praying for them because you can't force them. And if you engineer any set of plans to get them in, uh, you might just be bribing them. And then when a crisis comes, they're gone. Because ultimately, every individual, young or old, has to make that choice and that commitment to respond to God's love and come. You hear what I said? may seem hard to us. We want to do this and do the next to force them, but <laughs> that don't work. They have to make that choice to respond to God's love all on their own ultimately for it to make sense. Otherwise, when pressure comes, they're gone. It's a serious thing, but it is true. So we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Watch it now, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So one of the spin-offs of not knowing the character of God is that we are afraid of judgment. Fear of judgment is a symptom of ignorance of the character of God. When an exam is coming, are you afraid of the teacher? What size that makes? 
When the exam is coming, the only thing you have to be afraid of is the same thing Alilika was talking about, a lack of preparation. You had a whole year to prepare. The exam is next week. You haven't prepared and you're afraid of the teacher. But that's nonsense. But that's the same nonsense here. God says, come, and when you come, I will not cast you out. I have given you everything in Christ. I will prepare you. I will hold you. I will keep you. You don't come, and then when you hear of judgment, you begin to blame God, get afraid of God, and tell lies, Satan's lies, about God. That's how Satan has deceived the whole world. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. One of the sisters I bring up on morning, Sister Yearwood, told me a lady was talking to her a few days ago, and the lady told her she is so afraid of God. So afraid. So does that, that is Satan's ploy and plan. But there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, torment, the Greek word. He that is afraid is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Praise the Lord. And every individual has to know this and respond to this love. We are to tell them the love, explain the love, invite them, do everything we can. Oh yes, we are to do everything we can. And pray for them. But ultimately... They must make that decision to respond to God's love. Zechariah 4, 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, and the, Greek, the Hebrew word there is military force, not by might, nor by power, not by any of those things that compel people, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And that's because the love of God is functionally constituted in his spirit. This is the same as saying, but by my love, saith the Lord of hosts. Because we're told in Romans 5, the love of God is shut abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6. Important text. And there's plenty of other texts that people have wrong, but can't see. But we leave that for another time. Come now to this one. There is therefore, watch it now. There is therefore only one way in which God can exercise what is called his wrath or his justice, and it is this. Those who choose to reject his ways of righteousness, he gives them up to their wrong choices, and they are thus separated from his righteousness with disastrous consequences. I remember people arguing against us. One group even had a radio program arguing against us and claimed that we don't understand justice because their definition of justice was the human definition that God allows in civil government, and they felt that that was God's absolute way. And they felt that, therefore, the only justice in the universe is our way of justice. You hurt or kill those who hurt or kill you. That is what God allows in our civil situation because... You're dealing with the carnal mind and there has to be that control. So th that was their definition. So they were saying we were devoiding God of justice. But listen to what absolute justice is in terms of God's operation. And we can't operate like that. Only God can do it because only God can withdraw and give up. That's why Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't destroy the soul. But fear him that can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Only God, God is the only one who can let you go to annihilation if you reject him. Important definition of God's justice. Those who choose to reject his ways of righteousness, he gives them up to their own choices. They are thus separated from his righteousness with disastrous, con disastrous consequences. Watch this example now. When Israel rejected God's counsel concerning having a king like the other nations around them, God gave them up to their choice. It is written down in 1 Samuel 8, in case you don't know, and you can read it. I'm sure you would have covered it in the Bible here. They sent Samuel to God, saying, we want a king like all the other nations. 1 Samuel 8, read it again. 
And God told Samuel, tell them, it is not my will for them, I love them, to have a king. They went back, Samuel explained everything to them. What he told Samuel? Ma, we don't mind with you, oh God say. You see the people of God? You hear the people of God? This ain't Egyptians talking, you know, or Chinese or Indians back then. This is the people of God. We don't mind what you. Oh, God say, we want a king like the other nations. So Samuel went back and told God, for Samuel, for everybody to read. And God said, Samuel, you don't cry. Don't be sad. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And God, watch, watch this. God gave them up to their choice of a king and actually did, did what? Help them choose and anoint the first king. Wrath with mercy. We'll prove it in a minute. We're going to prove for a direct text that that was giving them up to their own choice to choose a king was wrath in a minute. This was an example of what the Bible calls his wrath or anger. And when the king, the chosen king, put chosen in inverted commas, because the same Bible will tell you about God chose this king and the next king. <laughs> you have to understand all this terminology. When the chosen king departed unrepentantly from God's righteousness, he also suffered wrath. You ready for the text? Hosea explains. Listen to God. Hosea 13, 9 to 11. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? In all thy cities? And thy judges of whom thou sayest, watch it, give me a king and princes. I gave thee a king in my wrath, in my anger, and took him away in my wrath. You see it there? God gave them a king that was wrath. When the king went further away, he was taken away wrath. So the Bible is explaining some very deep things here. So whenever God gives up a people to their wrong choice, according to the Apostle Paul, that is an example of the mechanism of wrath. So you see this world in which we live now and the things that are going on? For years, people have heard and rejected God's way of righteousness. God's way of righteousness in every area. And God, since he cannot force himself where he's not wanted, gives up those who make those choices, gives them up to their choice. It is still mercy because they can still be convicted and repent if they choose. But he gives them up. Gives them up to their choice. And sometimes, and many a time, God is hoping that they learn the lessons from the pain of their choice to repent and come back. Because he's a God of mercy. So what is God saying here? He gave them a king in his anger and took him away in his wrath. Let's go back then to this part we have here and make sure you understand it. When Israel rejected God's counsel concerning having a king like the other nations around them, God gave them up to their choice. Read 1 Samuel 8. This was an example of what the Bible calls his wrath or anger. We just read it in Hosea. And when that chosen king behave badly even further, like King Saul, God allowed him to be removed. Okay. Hosea 13, 9 to 11. Remember it. Hosea 13, 9 to 11. Okay, now notice that in Hosea 13, 11, it is said that God took away Saul in his wrath. Okay. Now, for those who are familiar with the history of our development in the character of God message, I remember this at a meeting at the Black Rock Church. Uh, about 43 years ago. And one particular person pulled out a text which said that God slew King Saul. First Chronicles 10, 14. God slew King Saul. Don't mind this upstart. God slew King Saul. And when I pulled out 1 Samuel 31, 4, that Saul killed himself, I didn't hear a further word. Those were the early days of trying to understand and people were blocking with words rather than let scripture 
examine itself and explain itself. So watch this. First Chronicles 10, 14 says it is written down that God slew King Saul. But first Samuel, read these texts for yourself, but first Samuel 31, 4, it is written down that Saul killed himself. As a matter of fact, he got struck. <laughs> watch this. Saul got struck with an arrow from the enemy. Listen to Saul's argument. I don't want the uncircumcised Philistines. A.T. Jones commenting says, the worst uncircumcision is uncircumcision of your heart, and you don't see it, so you're calling the uncircumcision of foreskin worse than you. So here's King Saul, uncircumcising heart, deliberately disobeying God, and telling the, the servant, oh dear, the hour hit me in my heart. Uh, don't let the uncircumcised come and cut off my head. You kill me so they won't have the credit of killing me. The poor armor bearer was sad and was uh, uh, alarmed. And Saul fell on his own sword and killed himself. One text says God slew King Saul. The other text says Saul killed himself. So we see the different linguistic expressions expressing the end result of God's wrath exercised upon Saul. Further verifying... That God's wrath means what the Apostle Paul explains in Romans 1. That God exercises his wrath by giving up those who reject his righteousness, his righteous ways, to their own way and its consequences. Now, although they had chosen the monarchy and rejected God, God is such a God of love and mercy that he gave them their choice and was prepared to work with them to bring them back to understanding his way for them in love and righteousness. So you had some kings that did very well and were called kings after God's own heart. Not that kings was God's way, but God was working with that wrath in mercy. Are you following me? Okay. Wrath mixed with mercy. When God gave Israel human kingship in his anger, it was anger mixed with mercy. Those kings who followed righteousness, watch this, those kings who followed righteousness were blessed and protected in the allotted time of worship. What a God. What a God. So they would choose a king. God gave them up to that choice. And yet those kings who followed righteousness were blessed and protected in their allotted time of leadership. Now, I tell you, not a soul can ever stand before God and blame him for anything except those who are blinded by Satan's lies about his character. Whereas those kings who refused to follow God's righteousness were taken away in wrath, that is, given up sooner, sooner rather than later. And you can read the entire book of Hosea Hosea is a very important book. You can read the entire book of Hosea and see the mercy of God in dealing with backsliding Israel. These words now are sad. Let them not apply to any of us until there was no remedy left. That is, until they hardened their heart against every effort of him to get them to choose and surrender to his love and his way. Wrath mixed with mercy. Even when God exercised wrath on Israel for their persistent backsliding, and they were given up or delivered over to their enemies, for example, handed over to Nebuchadnezzar, that is called a punishment, but God handed them over to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, by the way, which Old Testament prophet didn't understand these things and uh, was arguing with God. Now, God is a wonderful God, you know. A God doesn't mind us asking questions and arguing with him until we understand. Do we have examples of this in the Bible? We have Jonah. God told Jonah, go and preach and tell Nineveh. And Jonah said, you make his board? I want to be called a false prophet because I know you. And Jonah catch a transport on the sea to go in the opposite direction. And God said, okay, Jonah, well, you can step aside and you go your way. God withdrew enough and Satan moved in, as we heard this morning, for the kill. 
And God still managed to enable Jonah to be swallowed and be vomited up on the ground. Because all the time in the fish, but he, start, talk, he said that he was in hell forever. And when he started to talk to God, God said, okay, Jonah, are you ready now to go to Nineveh? And he still gone to Nineveh. When he did what he did, start quarreling with God. You see, now the people repent and you don't burn them up, but you go, how, how I look? And then he get vexed with the Lord because a plant grew up and withered in the hot sun when it was cooling him. He had a lot of self to be gotten rid of. None of God's prophets is perfect. But the prophet Habakkuk, read Habakkuk. Habakkuk said, my people are really bad, God. There's no justice in the streets. They're oppressing the poor. When they come before the judges, they get unfair. Uh, I can't understand why you're not doing anything about it. This is Habakkuk to God. And God said in due course, a nation is going to come and discipline you're the people that you call my people. And Habakkuk said, but that's bad now. You mean you can bring a worse people to punish your people? Why well, can't understand? Not understanding the issues of how nations rise and fall. And God was patient with those men. What a God. God told Moses, step back. Let me destroy and avert as come as these people. Moses said, well, you're going to have to blot out my name out of the book of life. You can't do this. So when we know God's love, we can talk to God and discuss things with God and problems with God. Okay? We can. He's the God of love and patience. All right. Let's continue here then. It was wrath mixed with mercy. God and God hoped they would understand, learn their lesson, and genuinely repent so he could heal and restore them. Okay? Praise the Lord. You know, in our Adventist history, we started very well uh, as an Adventist people in 1844. Did well up until... The 1850s, then something insidious, like a cancer, started to develop. No, a cancer starts one single cell, turns wild, and it grows, multiplying fast, but it takes time to be manifested. And then we heard that the spiritual malady of lukewarmness had become officially applied to God's people by 1858-59. God sent the cure because all that generation messages came and uh, the people just couldn't see. The Spirit of Prophecy said they were in a condition but just couldn't see their condition. Whoa. Then God sent a message in 1888, the true gospel, showing them God's amazing love. And that message was not accepted. So the spiritual malady continued, consequences developed, changes of doctrine, and we've been in this long delay ever since. Wow. God is a merciful God. And yet in every satanic attack, God can work things out for good. Because for example, we say, for example, if, if of course, Two ways looking at that. If, if, you're not, if you're not here, you don't know. Somebody asked me, but Brother Douglas, if the people had been ready in the second generation there after 1888 and everything had wrapped up, what, what about us? I said, what about us? We would not be in existence, so we wouldn't know. It wouldn't have mattered. But thank God now we are here and we have the opportunity to do what has been missed in the past. Let us not miss it now. Okay? Last paragraph here. But their repentance was not sustained. And they spiraled downhill until they rejected the Messiah and his apostles. Heard it this morning in the, in the, 
uh, the lecture on Israel. So, what a God. God's people has given him so much trouble. We included so much trouble. All that God did, wrath and mercy, hoping to bring them back, they spiraled downhill until they rejected the Messiah and his apostles in the AD 31 to 34 period. And they were given up to destruction by the Romans in AD 70. Given up to destruction. Great Controversy chapter 1 talks about that. And in that chapter, brings out wonderful principles about God's character, which we look at Sabbath. Moving on. Not going to be long today because they see some people uh, struggling. Saw a sister this, not long ago who told me that she walked this morning. She walks every morning and she's alert. Uh, her youngest sister uh, didn't join her. Hope she remains a bit. Hosea 4 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And the worst ignorance is ignorance of God. We are told that the darkness that covers the world is darkness of misapprehension of God. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Look at the principle of giving up or, or withdrawing. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Principle of wrath and mercy. Israel destroyed for lack of knowledge. Which means that God gave them knowledge and they rejected it. Has God given us as the Seventh Adventist world knowledge? Given us knowledge on the gospel, knowledge on the character, and you will meet Seventh Adventists who can't tell you the first letter in the gospel and never heard anything about the character. And that's because an atmosphere of hiding and rejecting has been passed on. Whoa. Hosea 11, 1 to 9 has become towards the end. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and call my son out of Egypt. God is love. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Baalim and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. Wow. I drew them with cords of a man, with cords, with bands of love. Look at God. Drawing with bands of love. And I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws. I laid food unto them. This is the God of love. He shall not return unto the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refuse to return. And the sword shall abide on his cities, and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their own counsels. Now, when, here are people, God called them, blessed them. Remember one of the first things they said? Moses, why you, have you brought us out of Egypt? Now, they were down in Egypt as slaves hollering for murder. Moses brought them out to tell Moses we had good food in Egypt. You see, you see the people of God? We at least had food in Egypt. Don't mind, we were getting beat. You bring us up now, no, we don't have any food. The people of God, you can't hold them. Well, well, well. Verse 7, look at verse 7. This applies to all of God's people, applies to us. We have to apply it to ourselves and repent. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. This, this, is, a, this is a bent. Though they called them to the Mosai, none at all would exalt him. And then God asked the question with tears in his eyes that we looked at before, the explanation that the Apostle Paul got for us. How shall I give thee up? 
Now imagine after all of that backsliding, you, you hear what God is saying? My people are bent to backsliding from me. God still says, how shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zebuim? These are the cities of the plain, which meant that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain suffered wrath by God giving them up and letting them go. And God says, and we had this explanation this morning in Brother Leacock's lecture, mine heart is turned within me. My repentance are kindled together. The circumstances change. God's people change. God was so hurt by their departure from him. He expressed the sadness, how shall I give thee up? How shall I deliver thee? So we're looking at wrath and mercy. And we have deeper waters to go into next two times as Thursday and Friday. And then Sabbath looking at this spread of prophecy on it. And I just want to say this. Uh, we have come to the point in time when, as Paul says in Corinthians, we should learn all these lessons because upon us the ends of the world are come. After a four-generation delay, this is a new first generation. We're approaching a midnight point because we're in the second generation, and the end of a second gener generation is called a midnight point. A midnight point. We know from examples in the Old Testament that that is always a crucial point. A crucial point for God's people to grasp it and be ready, or God forbid, further any delay. May we ask God to cure us of our bent to backsliding. Heed his call of love. Surrender all. So that he wouldn't have to say, how shall I give thee up? He will say, enjoy. Where are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, which is Satan's taunting? And will answer, here at last are they that have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. Satan's defeat at Calvary is reiterated through them by Jesus Christ. They know my character. They accept my salvation. And they are going to allow me to finish the work of God through them. So knowing the gospel and knowing the character of God, intellectually and experientially, of critical importance in getting us ready. He goes on, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. I will not enter into the city. So God, God wants the best for us. He wants this bent of backsliding to be cured, and it is only cured by seeing his love as revealed in Jesus Christ and surrendering all, so that our souls are cleansed of all defilement, emptied of self, receiving the victory of Christ by being in him, not dipping out and going away, plunging into him and surrendering to him and drawing ourselves in him. That is where we are to be. We thank him for his character. We thank him for his love. And this is the foundation for the next three, where we're going deeper and deeper as to how this character will tie in with the final generation. God bless you. And I thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we all need in the name of Jesus, our eyes returned to you through your son, to see your love, your character, your true gospel, all that you have done for us, and your constant invitation to come because the things of this world, whatever they are, are nothing. They're empty. They're going to be, they're separated from you. And when you let them go, they will annihilate. The earth and everything in it says the apostle Peter will be burned up. But you're calling us to come away from emptiness that masquerades as something. And find all of our pleasure, all of our joy, all of our entertainment 
all of our happiness, all of our goodness in you, your truth, your righteousness, your plan for us. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. There will be joys in heaven that none of the foolishness on this earth can compare with. The nonsense they call entertainment, the nonsense they call culture, pure corruption and madness. And we pray for our young people that their eyes will be turned from that rubbish to the pure joys of knowing you and your love and your salvation. Cure us of our bent to backsliding. As we read about ancient Israel, let us not look back at them pointing the finger. Let us examine our hearts and surrender all. Forgive, cleanse, convert, deliver us from lukewarmness, and may we cry out every day for the new conversion, fresh baptism of your Holy Spirit, fresh deliverance from lukewarmness, so that we remain in Christ, seeing ourselves outside of him as nothing, and seeing ourselves in him as complete with his righteousness. Forgive us and save us. Continue to bless the camp meeting. You've brought us to day four, the midway point. Be with us in the afternoon sessions of lecture and discussion. And for the remaining four days, Thursday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and then the final Sabbath, continue to pour out your spirit to send the light and to carry us forward. And may we not just listen to enjoy, but apply these principles to our lives to make this the generation of restoration. And in the few remaining hours, let's say months, in this second watch, to allow you to make us ready. Because once this second watch passes, the third watch is where it must be for our people who are ready. Have mercy upon us. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, may God bless you real good. We have a, a luncheon break and then our lecture number four and then our book study and then tonight, of course, lecture number five. Make the most of camp, follow, listen, learn, share, pray, and let each of us make that individual preparation, knowing God's love, and ask him to cure us of the bent to backsliding and prepare us for the events which must be so near because we sense that the people around the world are getting ready. May we be among them. So God bless you. We thank God for bringing us to Tuesday, the fourth day. Four more days left. Keep praying. Keep making the most of camp. And may God bless you real good. Thank you.